continue the discussion. Uh, in this example, we have a factory and it says hazardous materials. Uh, we're, we're not gonna have this in our project, but this is for risk category three and the importance factor. If we're gonna go back to it, it's gonna be 1.25. We have the SS and S1 based on these two locations, right? You can just go also to the same uh, link provided and you just, uh, you test it. You figure out SS and S1. And then um, you can have D and you can have also D default, just, you know, when it comes to the site um, type or the site category, you can have D or D default. In this case, I use your D default and this give you the analysis. This is give you the SDS and SD1 that I should be able to use. And um, based on this, I should be able also to do the seismic design category. When you do the seismic design category, I have two options, either that I'm gonna be using these tables. First, you do this check. If you're done with it, you know that you're gonna be risk category, uh, let's say three in this case. And then um, you figure out if this one's gonna be more than 0.75 G or equal to it. So you're gonna be E or F. If not, you're gonna be going through the two tests and whichever is larger is gonna be controlling. Now here, what I meant by larger, for example, D is going to be larger than C, larger than B, rather larger than A. And we went through this exercise before. Uh, the other way of doing it is also look through these tables. I don't know if you guys have seen these tables before. It's going to be based on the SS and S1. And you should be able to figure out um, the site, um, or if you like full size design category, you just figure it out. So what's going to happen uh, for this table here, you look at it and then it says either A, sometimes it says B or C, B or C, sometimes C or D or just D, right? So if there's only one thing, it means if your, let's say your SS is gonna be 0.3 and your side class is C, it means that you have either B or C. But let's say if your SS is gonna be 0.7 and your side class is gonna be C, you know for sure it's gonna be D. So it's like category D, right? So you know this for sure. So why do we have two values here? Why C or D? Reason is because when you have two values, if you have risk category one or two or three, you're gonna be going with the first one. If you have risk category four, you're gonna be going with the second one. So for example, if I have your side class C and SS is gonna be 0.3 and the risk category that I have for my project is gonna be four, I'm gonna be going here with C. But if size of design category here, can be B for the other risk categories, like one, two, or two, or three. Let's say that I have an office building. And in this office building, I have site classes C and SS is equal to 0.3. I'm gonna end up with size line category of B, not C. This gave you the difference between the two. And then you're gonna be doing the check here, based on SDS and also based on SD1. And this is exactly the same as a table. So you can use this safely if you like to. Uh, in this example here, um, you really need to study this example. It is not going to be in your uh, um, in your midterm, but it's going to be in your final, and also you're going to be doing your project. For this location that was given to you, which is this location here, let's say let's just say with the values. I thought it's going to be based on the previous example, but this is your different. They give you the latitude of 40 and longitude of negative 118, which means 118 west. And then it says here, what is the natural period that's gonna be used to determine the code base shear? Uh, I'm referring here to the previous slide set. If I may go to it for quick. The previous slide set, we have this equation, V equals C sub S times W. And to do C sub S, you need to have T in your analysis of this T. So discussion here about this one, about this guy, this natural period here, T that you need to use in your analysis. And um, usually we have two ways of doing it. You either can go approximate method or you can go with the detailed method or accurate method. If you like to go with the approximate method, you just find out TA. So TA is gonna be the approximate method or approximate natural period, if you like, using the approximate method, which is this method here. 
But let's say that you have all the information about the building. You have the mass, you have the column size, and you have everything you need, which means that you can do find the natural period based on this dynamic properties. And the question is, which one you're going to be using? Can you just use T accurate, or we can use T approximate? And if you have T accurate and turns to be very high compared to the approximate, you have a limit. And again, the limit is going to be equal to a factor called C sub U times T A the approximate, which means if you really like to go with this accurate method of doing the initial period, you need also to do the approximate because uh, the approximate here is going to also give you a limit based on this code section. And C sub U itself is going to be based on, as you see here, is going to be based on SD1. And also you can use this graph to find it out. So if your SD1, which most likely is gonna happen, is gonna be more than 0.3, you know that C sub U here is gonna be equal to 1.4. So in this problem here, it says, which natural period can you use in your analysis? We'll come to the page here. So I'm gonna say, in this case, I need to have this accurate uh, natural period. And also I need to have the approximate natural period, both of them. I have some information here given to me. It says if you put here 200 caps and you put here 150 caps for this moment frame, you're gonna have here displacement of one inch and here displacement of 0.35 inches. So this displacement is giving the elastic displacement. This is not the inelastic displacement. Example, this is gonna be this displacement that you're talking about. If I go and go to it in a second, where is the plan? Okay, it should be here. I'm talking about this delta yield, which is a displacement based on elastic properties. So you put some force, you get here some displacement. I'm not talking about this inelastic displacement. I'm talking about the elastic displacement. So this displacement here is gonna be elastic. And here is the weight of the building. You have your 1200 kips on this level and 1000 kips on this level. In the past, also, I give you an equation to do this. If you have single degree freedom system, this gave you the equation, which we have right here, which is this one. It says here T equals two pi square root of M over K. This for single degree freedom system, but if you have multi-degree freedom system, which means that you have two levels or more, this gives you the equation that you need to use. So I'm planning to use this equation in this example here. I'm planning to use it. If you look here, it says natural period T is gonna be equal to two pi, which is very similar to the single degree freedom system, screw it off, and then you have WI delta I. So I'm thinking here, where's WI? Because it says summation from I equals one to N. WI is gonna be the weight of this level, like a thousand kip times delta i squared. Now where is delta i? I'm gonna say delta i for this level is gonna be 0.3 inches. It's 0.35 inches, right? Squared plus 1200 kips times one, and then you're gonna square it. Divide by g, now it depends on units. Uh, units, if you are working with inches, is gonna be 386.4. If you work here with feet, is gonna be 32.2. And then it says, give you summation of each force multiplied by displacement. So each force multiplied by displacement. You understand that when you multiply a force by displacement, it's gonna give you the stiffness, right? So this is gonna be representing the stiffness. And when you do the weight multiplied by delta I squared would be representing the mass for you. So, okay, here's the equation. Same equation that I was just talking about a minute ago or a second ago. Now let's see the weight. And this delta just confirm the way that we are doing it. If you look here, this is gonna be the roof, right? 1200 kip multiplied by one squared. It's gonna be here. 1200 multiplied by one squared plus a thousand multiplied by 0.35 squared. Here's the thousand multiplied by 0.35 squared divided by G. In this case, I'm using inches. So I'm gonna be using here 386 um, inch per second squared. I'm having here 200 kip times one inch. So I'm gonna say here 200 kips times one inch plus 150 times 0 0.35, 150 times 0 0.35 and nothing here is squared under square root. And with that, I'm having here 0 0.73 seconds. This is now it's gonna be accurate. I'm gonna be calling this accurate because it is gonna be based on what? 
this is based on the mass, the stiffness, and the column, the formation, the whole thing. So we can say accurate. Okay, now also I need to find out the approximate because according to the code it says here, if I take you back here to the previous slide set, it says you need, you cannot just use the accurate or the one that you do based on dynamic analysis. You need to compare it with this Tmax. If you are gonna be going here beyond Tmax, you need to use Tmax. If it's gonna be lower than Tmax, then actually you need to use this T accurate. We'll see the example. For this moment frame, I'm gonna be taking uh, this equation, I'm going to put it right there, which is uh, C sub T times H N to the power of X. And as we said, I'm going to be choosing here, my choice is going to be 0.28, right? It's going to be 0 0.028 and 0.8 for the exponent. This is what I used. And the building height here, I use 30 feet. Where this is coming from, I'm going to go back here one slide, it's going to be 30 feet for the total height of the building. So in your case, it's going to be 14 times 3. Right, because you have 14 feet for one story height times three, you're gonna end up with 42. So with that, you have here uh, T approximate is gonna be 0.425, much less than this. Now you need to work on the C sub U value. You do your analysis to find out C sub U value. What's the importance of C sub U value? Because T max is gonna be equal to C sub U times T approximate C sub U was found to be here 1.4 because the SD1 value is kind of high. So I'm gonna have here C sub U of 1.4. Maximum initial period that you can use for this moment frame is gonna be 1.4 times the 0.425, which is this T approximate. I'm gonna take it from there, right? It's gonna be 0.6 seconds. Now this gonna be my limit. So the T max here is 0.6 seconds while based on dynamic properties is equal to 0.73 based on the accurate method. So in this case, I cannot really go beyond this limit. This is here a limit, right? Like the maximum value that you can use. So in this case, I'm gonna be taking natural period to be used in the analysis, give you 0.6 seconds. Now what happened if this value here, this is gonna be, let's say in a separate example, different example or different scenario that this natural period equals 2.3 seconds. What value should I have used in my analysis? 0.3. Okay, exactly, it's gonna be 0.3. Because now I know that the structure is gonna be very stiff. Natural period here is gonna be low and I should have been using it and not use the approximate. Now, if I don't have enough information, which natural period I'm gonna be using in this case? If I don't have this number here, what value should I use? Approximately. Okay. okay, should I use 0.6 or should I use 0.4 to 5? 0.4 to 5. Exactly. So this gave me the one that I'm going to be using. So if no accurate, if no accurate values, use T sub A. All right. Professor, where did you get C sub U of 1.4 from? Um, you have the SD1 based on the location. I have the SD1, okay? And okay. once you look here at SD1 is 0.392, I'm gonna be coming here. I'm gonna say 0 0.392 is given this side. Therefore, C sub U is gonna be equal to 1.4. Okay. Good question, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Um, oh, professor, where did yes. you get two by two, two by three from? Where the what? Say um, in the last example for SD one, you uh, multiplied um as uh, zero point three four four into two by three into one point seven one two. So where is this two by three coming from? Two by three. This two thirds. Yes. yes sir. This two thirds. This is the formulation. This is how you do the SD one and SDS. This is how you get from the SS and S1 to SD1 and SDF. You have this two thirds. So this is a constant when you? Yeah, and this constant. And, and this is mainly in the AC7, uh, 2016 and 10 and all of these versions. Then to take it from the something called SMS to the SDS. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. 
Um, anyways, if you can just use a website and if you like to, uh, if you are just able to find SD1, this one, just use it the way it is. You don't have to go through this equation if you have a means or method to do it, okay? Okay, Professor. All right. Uh, in this example here, uh, I have a special mode frame connected to original diaphragm, and they have six special mode frames in each direction, which means I have six of these. I have the location of the building, and the site contains rock, which means site class C. Seismic weight is going to be 1,000 kip supported by six moon frames. So I'm going to have this supported by how many columns? Well, I have 12 columns, OK? Supports 1,000 kip, not just two columns to support this. It says determine the code page here. And actually, this is what you're going to be doing in your uh, in your uh, project, right? You have certain number of columns. You need to come up with the initial period. So in our case here, we're going to say, if you like to consider only just the moon frame, what's going to be the initial period? Just disregarding the brace frame. The lateral and, stiffness. What? The lateral stiffness of 12 column, we can get the I value from IRC. Yes, I'm not there yet. Yes, but you're correct. Yes. So in your case here, you're going to have three uh, three levels for the project. And you're going to be doing the initial period based on this dynamic properties. And of course, you're going to be doing it based on the approximate method, and do the comparison, right? And most likely, this is going to be controlling. The C sub U times T A is going to be controlling. And then eventually, you're going to be using this value here in your design. Not exactly 0.6, but what I'm saying is give you the same value that you get or similar value that you would get if you run the analysis on your project. Uh, for this, uh, uh, as it says here, uh, this gave me for just uh, for this building. Um, I don't know the occupants of it. So I'm going to be assuming it's going to be risk category two. Let's say it's going to be an office. Importance factors going to be one. I have this S and S1. And eventually I'm going to have here the S, D, S, and S, D1. So it's going to be the bottom line. This gave you the two values. Um, uh, if you are asking for the two thirds, you're going to have here detailed problem that shows how to get from the S, S, and S1 to the S, D, S, and S, D1. And if you open the code, you're going to see here this two thirds. This here is going to be one uh, level. So you're going to have single degree freedom system. And with that, you should be able also to do the initial period based on this equation. I'm going to have here 12 columns. This is why it says here 12 columns. Amount of inertia for each column is going to be 2660 inches of four. So for this one here, this term is going to be the amount of inertia for all columns. And because the column here is going to be fixed top, fixed at the bottom, the stiffness is going to be 12 EI over H cubed. Okay, here's 12. E is going to be 29,000 for the seal. And H, I need to put it here in inch. Since this moment of inertia is going to be in inches of four, I need those to put this height is going to be also in inches. So 15 times 12, because it's going to be 15 feet times 12 to the three. And this give you the stiffness as in kip per inch. Now here's the initial period. T is going to be two pi squared of M over K. I have the total weight of a thousand kip. So I'm going to see here 1,000 kip, divide here by G. So what value is this? I say this can be here G as an inch per second square. Divide by the stiffness. And with that, I'm going to have 0.23 seconds. So based on dynamic properties, natural period is going to be equal to 0.23 seconds. Also, I should be able to find out T approximate and see what's going to happen with T approximate. The column height is going to be only 15 feet, same factor, coefficient, same exponent. You can end up with 244. Your C sub U here is going to be on this line. It's not going to be really at more than 0.3. So I'm going to be somewhere here in the middle. We're going to be here, right? So I should be able to use this equation to find out C sub U. Here's the equation. Just to show it to you again. Here's the equation 1.7 minus 1.5 times SD1 minus 0.1. I have here the SD1 and here's C sub U. And this gives me the max value that I'm gonna be using for 
T in my analysis is give you 0.38. Now let me put all the numbers together. Yeah, see here, T max 0.38, T approximate 0.244. How about T based on dynamic properties? It says here 0.23. So yeah, see T accurate 0.23 seconds. 0.23 seconds. Now compare it with the max. It's gonna be less than the max. Now, which value should I use now? Should I use T approximate or T accurate? In this case, I'm gonna be using here T accurate. So what if T approximate is less than T accurate and T max then? Yes, this is what happened. T accurate is less than this value, right? No, uh, T approximate is the lowest one. Then when we use T approximate or T actual, uh, T no, accurate. T accurate. Is gonna be the accurate in this case. The only um, I'm gonna see here uh, incident that you are gonna be using your T approximate if you don't have T accurate. Okay. So we decide here to use T of 0.23 second. I know it's gonna be a moon frame. And this gave me category or building C.1, moon frame, the first category. This is the reason I called here C sub one, C.1. R factor of eight, I'm gonna be running these equations. And I'm gonna be applying also the minimum. At the bottom here, I have the C in this case, is gonna be 0 0.081, right? Because you have a maximum value, it's lower than the max, you have a minimum value, it's more than the minimum. So this gave me the value to use. So at the end, take this value multiplied by a thousand kip, you have 81 kips as a lateral force acting on 12 columns. Any questions? We're good, all right. Now vertical distribution of seismic forces. What does it mean by that? We can have here, let's say three level or three story building, and they have one big force like this big force here, like 81 caps. I'd like you to divide it, let's say on three, four buildings, three, four stories. Like in this case here, let's assume for a second that I have a total force of, I'm gonna put it there, right? The phase shear. Phase shear meaning what? It's gonna be the force acting here as a reaction. Let's just see here for a second that this V, right? I should expect here the values. I'm gonna say, let's say here V equals 350 caps. When I run the code equations, I'm gonna come up with the 350 kips. Now, based on this 350 kips, the question is how much force should I give to each level? It just happened here that I have it pre solved for us and I start with 200 kips and then 150 kips. But how would you come up with these two values? This is what you call here vertical distribution of force. Meaning, again, I can give you here a building and this building is gonna be composed of few levels. So I'm gonna say here's one level, right? two, three, four, few levels like that. I have the total force act in the building and it says, for example, 1,000 kip. Which is the same as a pay shear. It's the same as this. And this one here, this gave me pays on the code analysis. So pays on the code, I came up with this V. I say this gave you 1,000 kip. It means reaction also is gonna be equal to a thousand kip. But now I don't know how much force should I put here. I need some force here, some force there, right? As you go down, you're gonna have some forces, right? At this level. And then finally also I need some force here. If you add all of these forces to each other, the gestation of the forces, they have to be equal to a thousand kip, right? Because you take a thousand distributed on all levels. This is what you call here vertical distribution forces. So F sub X is giving you the force at level X. It says here, vertical distribution factor is giving you CVX, but F sub X itself, it's as it says here, the lateral size force F sub X induced at any level. So this gave you the force at level X. This gave you equal to some coefficient which is this distribution factor multiplied by V. And V is gonna be the phase shear that we just determined here. 
total force acting on the building, like the one we have here, like the thousand, for example. Let's give you V. So your job here is to find out this CVX. And for each level, CVX is going to be given by this equation. It's just copy and paste from the code, right? It says here for each level, the level weight itself is going to be equal to WX. And HX is going to be the height from the seismic pace. So for example, if I have here two-story building and the height of each level is going to be 15 feet, H for the first level is going to be equal to 15 and H for the roof is going to be equal to 30 feet. We have here definition for all of that. And then there is an exponent here called K and also we have this K. And K is going to be based on the initial period that's used in your analysis. The code gives it to you this way. It says K is going to be equal to, and look at the code. Usually they give you a small paragraph. They didn't give you a chart like this. So I came up with this chart. If natural period here is going to be 0.5 or less, your K factor is going to be equal to one. You're going to have this linear distribution of forces. Once you go above 0.5 second, this K factor is going to be growing up to a maximum of two. Now, what is the effect of this K factor? If I give you here any building composed of number of stories, right? Let's say 10 stories. I'm gonna start here by putting the lateral forces on each level, right? So we're gonna say, let's just put it this way. I'm gonna end up with linear distribution of forces. So all the forces can be like this, right? So you can draw the forces this way. Which means if all the height here is going to be equal and they have three equal stories when it comes to the height, so the story height here is going to be the same as here, same as this here. If this is here is going to be equal to 30 kips, this is going to be equal to 10 kips, this is going to be equal to 20 kips. So when this is going to happen, I'm going to say F T is equal or less than 0.5 seconds. And in this case, again, the force on the top here is going to be equal to 3 times F. And the force here is going to be equal to 2 times F. And the force here is going to be equal to F. So if I'd like to find out the F value, the force value, and I have here the pace share, I'm going to put here some number. I'm going to say the pace share equals 700 kips. How much is F? F equals? Someone help me with this? Let's make it 600 kips. If V is equal to 600 kips, how much is that? Uh, 100 kips. 100 kips. And therefore, this is going to be how much here, the force? I'm going to say equal to 100 kips. And the force here is going to be equal to 200 kips. And the force here is going to be equal to 300 kips. A total of 600 at the base. This is going to happen when T is going to be equal or less than 0.5 seconds. So if you are in this region, because K here is going to be equal to 1. The problem is going to happen once K is going to be greater than 1. And this curve or this line or this distribution is going to be like this. It's going to be completely different. It's going to be something like this. If I may do it, it's going to be like this, like this, and then like this. So distribution of the forces at the lower level is going to be less. And most of the seismic forces are going to be shoot up. And we call this the whipping effect. So most of the force is going to be pushed up, which is not good because it's going to be creating a higher overturning moment at the base. Uh, what did you say it's called, Professor? Whipping. You know, when you have a whip. Oh. Yeah. 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 The weird name, but this is the name we use. Thank you. OK, we have a nice example on this, complete example. And this exam should have, this is up to a twin story building, right? So you should be able to do it in your project. You have a twin story concrete shear wall building. Here's the initial period is gonna be one second. And this is gonna be here. I mean, one second, you're gonna be here in the middle of this, right? So we're gonna have here some K value. And then you have the weight of each level is gonna be 800 kips. Now in your case, it's gonna be different. Maybe the first two levels gonna be the same weight, but the roof is gonna be a little bit different, right? Here's the HI. So HI is going to be the level because the story height is going to be 10 feet. 
So the first one here is gonna be at 10 feet, 20, 30 feet, which means this is gonna be here the distance measured from the base to the level of interest. So for example, H2 is gonna be from here to there. H3 is gonna be from here to here, right? And H1 is gonna be for the first one. It's gonna be like this. So it's gonna be the distance. It is not gonna be the story height. It's gonna be the distance from the base, seismic base. Now you do WI times HI to the K and your K factor, as it says here is gonna be 1.25 based on this equation, right? Your K is gonna be equal to 1.25. And then you can find out here CVX based on this equation. Find out the CVX. Take the CVX, multiply it by the pay shear. It just happened that the pay shear is going to be the same as the story weight, right? Just coincidence. It does not mean to be this. It just happened to be the same value. So you take this here CVX, multiply here by 800 kips, which is a seismic force. It's going to give you the force acting on the building. On each level. Let's give it the roof, ninth, all the way to the first level. This is going to be a good stopping point here. We're going to be talking about size provisions. And I know that you guys, you can download this document, 34116. I guess you have a link for it already. So please download this. Um, we have a few chapters. So this give you the chapter, chapter A, B, C, all the way to H. The chapter, I really care about the chapters. It's gonna be about general provisions. You're gonna have lots of information here, also B, A, B, C. And then I, I'm not gonna be really interested in this one. I'm really interested in the moment frame system and the brace frame system. So I'm gonna be working on E and F and a little bit about A, B, and maybe C, but C is not critical. So I'm gonna be interested in A and B, like, like general information. And then also I'm gonna be interested in E and F. Uh, e is going to be very important to us, and we're going to be doing a good example on it. We're going to be going in details about mold frame. We really need to understand this and the way it works. Um, I guess should be we should stop here. Am I correct? How do you guys feel about this? Should now we talk about the exam? Yeah, I think that yeah, be good. I guess this is going to be a good point. Professor? Yes. Is any of lecture 10 uh, included on the second exam? Um, no. No, okay. not really. OK. All right. You're going to have four problems. We discussed this plan view some given forces on it and then we say that uh, you remember this example we went through it in details right you guys remember this yes, yes sir. professor okay it's gonna be there you need to see something very similar to this now in the x direction what system is this is this dual system in the x yes and in the y direction Yes. Okay, this 25%, uh, is it applicable for the dual system or for the moon frame system? Or for both of them? Dual system. Only dual system, right? So if I'm gonna be looking at this plan and say, how about in the X direction? I have based on the stiffness distribution. Did you guys hear this before? Stiffness distribution, stiffness analysis? Yes or no? Did you guys hear it before? No? Yes? I don't think I've heard of it personally. Stiffness analysis. So what's stiffness analysis? What is this distribution based on? The one that I'm talking about here, like 100 and then you have 5, 45, 45 and 5. What do you call this distribution here? Is this the stiffness distribution? It's depend on the moment of energy of the columns. Yeah, and the entire system. So, but let me put it here for you. Yes, 
just say, let me open this box, right? I'm gonna open a new box. I'm gonna put it here. It says here, stiffness analysis. Can you read this please, Mike? Uh, sure, it says stiffness analysis showed the following force distribution on the moment frames and brace frames. Okay, so the stiffness analysis means that you have a structure analysis model and based on the stiffness of these members, uh, let's say in this direction, it shows five kips, 45 kips, 45 kips, and five kips. So you understand that's gonna be based on the structure analysis. So you can say based on the stiffness analysis or structure analysis, this gives you the same conclusion, okay? Okay, so let me look here at this building. I'm gonna say, how about in the X direction? What's gonna happen? I'm gonna give you a 1,000 kip. 1,000 kips is gonna be active in the X direction. First moment frame, sees how much? Yes, say, uh, can someone help me with this? 500 okay. kips maybe, yeah. Do I have any brace frame? No. I don't. Now, what is moment frame one? Do you guys see MF1? Yes. What is the design force for MF1? 500 kips. And MF2? 500 kips. Okay. Is this based on the 25% rule? No, just one system in the X direction. Okay. All right. But if I'm going to give you here this, is going to be in the let's say in a case like this, when you have a dual system, what you need to do is to do the 20%, right? Is it 20%? 25%. 25%, thank you. So I'm gonna be doing here the 25% and then based on the 25%, I may pump up the design forces in moment frame one and two. But how about this brace frame? Should I reduce the design forces on them? They remain the same. They're going to stay the same, which means that you can compare and take the highest value if you want to. All right. I'm going to take you here to the connection design. You're going to see here a connection design. So when you design. say the highest value, did you mean the sum of all these values? Like mean? Like what we have done here. If you remember this example, do you remember this example, right? Yes. We said, well, we're going to have here 100 kips. But I want this five kips to be how much? Both of these two to be 25%, which means I need to have to have here 12%, 12 and a half, 12 and a half. But does it mean that both of these two brace frames is gonna be designed for, for 75? I'm gonna keep them as to be 90%. All right. Okay. Very good, excellent. So I'm gonna be going here through this table. I understand the connection and you should expect a problem like this again. So how many times now you have seen it? How many times? How many homeworks? How many quizzes? Have you seen this? A few. A few, which means that you should be getting here like 100% in this problem, I guess, right? So in, the, in your... Um, project, you have the beam size and the beam size can be critical because the beam size, based on the beam size, you should be able to figure out the shear, right? The shear in the beam and the plate and so forth. Correct? Is it okay? Yeah. Professor, so, yes. Sorry, I just had a quick question. For the shear check on the beam, uh, do we use the 0. 0.65 FYAE equation? 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. Oh, just 0. 0.6 FYAE net or AE? Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, professor, isn't in point right here. This is the one. I... This is the one we were talking about, right? Yes, sir. So we have the slide set number four for the lecture members. When you do the check on the share, be sure that you understand this and find out AW, the web. Now, in your case, we use W section, right? Did you use W section in your yes. project? 
Yes, Professor. Is this the only section I have? No, we have uh, angles, channels, um, dual sections. Okay, very good. Sections. All right. Okay, so expect different sections, not gave a W section. So be ready that once this is a section, you can run to it. You can say, how about the bolts? Hmm. Bolts. I'm not going to have any of these bolts. I'm not going to have 325 and because I'm looking here at these bolts, right? Look at the bolts here. What type of bolts? Just going back here quick. What is that? Oh, I have group A, group B, group C. Okay. I have 325, 490, 3043, and an X. How about if I have something completely different? What should I do? Can I come back here? So which one is this? A325. A, B, C. How about here? What is this? Which group is this? Can someone help me here with this? Which group is this? It's Ankara. This is a group that you don't know lots of information about them. But all what you know may be F sub U, the ultimate strength. So when it comes to the shear, right? And you don't know the exact designation of the bolt, something that you never heard about. You're going to be looking at F sub U and then multiply by 0.45 if you have N type. But if you have X type, you multiply by 0 0.563. So a few of the bolt. If I give here a few for this material, okay. right? Multiply by 0 0.45 is going to be N. We'll multiply by 0 0.563 is going to be X. And then which equation do you use after? You can say after this, you just use this equation. Okay. So we can hold, uh, if it's so I'm not going to give you the standard bolt that you are used to. I'm not going to give you um, like machine bolt or A325 or A490, yes. right? I'm not going to give you any of that. I'll give you something like this, something different. Yes. And I need, right? We need to make the problem a little bit different. Otherwise, give you just repetition of the previous example that you guys have gone through. All right, you're good? Yeah, I'm good. Excellent, excellent. Now, how many problems did we do so far? You see, we did two problems. So still have two other problems. Now, I need to ask you a few questions about this problem here. Do you guys understand the meaning of this response spectrum? Yeah, do you understand what is this about? Relationship between natural period of the structure of, of the building itself and between the spectral iteration of the structure. You know definition of this mu, ductility factor. If you remember, it's gonna be the ultimate displacement divided by the displaced ratio of this to that. And it's gonna be a representation or it represents the ductility of the system. How much the structure is going to be going beyond the yield point without failure and cracking and damage? What happened here? How do you dissipate the energy? This is going to be through buckling of the braces. How do you dissipate the energy here in an eccentric brace frame? We call this shear yielding. You guys remember this? Can I put it here? Shear yielding. We've done this before, right? We discussed this in details. How about the moment frames? Where's the plastic change is going to happen? At the end of the column, at the end of the beam. Can someone help me with this? At the face of beam and column connection. 
So it's giving the beam, right? At both ends of each beam. Yes, right. with the beam, we don't, yeah, we don't want to be in columns. Yeah, but it's gonna happen at the end of the beam itself, correct? At the end of the beam. Yes. Okay, good. We call this to be protected zone. You remember this term, protected zone here? Why? Because you're gonna have high strains. Also in here, we call this to be protected zone. You remember this? We said nothing's gonna happen in here, right? You see this, no welder attachment. So what do you call this? Protected zone, we call it also plastic hinge. So you understand protected zone. Am I correct? Yes? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So you know protected zone, you know plastic hinge is gonna happen at the end of beams in the moment frame. How about the protected zone in the eccentric brace frame? Where is it gonna happen? What do you call this area here? Link. Link beam. Link. Link beam. Okay, good. Um, how do you dissipate the energy in brace frame? Tensile yielding and buckling of the braces. Okay. Why do we have this RBS section in moon frames? This RBS, why do we do it? You remember this long discussion? What is the reason that we have this RBS thing? You remember the RBS, reduced beam section? Why do we have this? So that the beam will show So that. then the beam should fit in uh, section three instead of section two. Okay, now when I ask this question in multiple choice problem, I'm not gonna say section one and two and three. So what would you say in this case? Designating control. area that's going to control for failure. Um, not failure. Are you calling? The, are you talking about hinging? To recall, to relocate the plastic hinge away from the face of the column. Control the the location. Maybe this is gonna be a better maybe answer. Control the location of the plastic hinge, right? Right. So this is gonna be controlling the location of the plastic hinge. I'd like to control it here. I don't want the plastic hinge to happen here. I don't want it to happen here. I want to control it to happen right here. So it's gonna be control the location of the plastic hand. In composite beams, can we be going here to the end of this? Do you guys remember this problem here? When you say composite versus non-composite, let's give you slide set number two introduction. Can someone here explain me what's going on here? Have you seen this problem? And have you seen this problem before? It was stating that uh, during uh, construction, we need to cut out uh, an area in the slab so that we can place uh, a crane over there. So what should, should we change the beam design? Or when they be the same, it was basically. Do you think that this opening that you are doing right next to the beam would that increase a, a composite action or reduce it? Reduce. Okay, so would that beam the would that make the beam the composite beam stronger or weaker? Weaker. Okay, so it's gonna make the beam weaker. It's gonna reduce uh, composite action and it's going to be what? But this will never increase the strength of the beam, correct? correct? Yes. Okay, would that reduce the shear capacity of the beam? No, the shear capacity is the same. Why? Are you saying because shear capacity shear... has not to do with the concrete slab? Yeah, shear capacity usually controlled by the beam, the steel beam only. Okay. Very good. Now the last problem is gave about vibrations because we didn't cover it yet, right? How can I make this problem simple and easy for you guys of vibration analysis? Here are the steps. How should I make this problem to be a simple problem? that you should be able to finish in 15 minutes. You see, here's the procedure. What should I do? 
maybe if the deflection is uh, given. Yeah, good. I'll give you deflection. No problem. What else? So you don't need to calculate W. There's right. You don't need to do any of that. Just give you deflection here. So what do you do after this? What do you do? We calculate the force. Is this a force? Frequency. Uh, the the frequency. frequency. Okay, thank you. Okay, we do the frequency, and then what do you do after? Well, the other frequency yeah. also for the girder. And then what do you do after? And then you do this equation. Now we need to figure out beta, right? Yes or no? What happened if I'm telling you that you have a couple of volts? You remember this problem when I said a couple of volts and then you have beams running across between the two volts? This gave you like this. Now, do I have here joist mode? Do I have girder mode or girder panel? Or just you don't joist. have girder panels. We only have only joist. joist So my equation is going to be simple because my equation is going to be Fn is going to be 0.18 G divided by delta of J, right? I don't have any of that. Do I have any of that? No. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Problem should be easy on you. Professor, what yeah. about D? The value of D. Which D? Um, if you... Uh, D I and D G. D G will not be used, but what about D I? So what is, why do you need this? If you have this, why do you need this? If you just have a joist and no, and you don't have any like girders, why do you need D? What's the use of it? To find the mass. This weight here? Yes. How is that? Where, where is the sand? Where is the weight? To find the weight, you need to calculate the effective weight B. Okay. I'm going to give you the weight. So weight is going to be given. Now, how long is it going to take you to finish the problem? If you have also the weight given to you. Should I say five minutes, 10 minutes, less? Here's the equation. You need to figure out AP over G. This gonna be the one that you're after, right? P sub zero is 65 pounds, right? F sub N, you'll figure it out for the beam. The weight is gonna be given beta. How do you do here the beta? If you have some information, you should be able to find out this beta from the table, if you recall this table, right? If you know the occupancy, you can come here and say your max is gonna be half percent. That's it. Now, do you guys have any questions for me? I'm done. Now I give you the exam. frames um so only if we have a dual system we use the 25 percent rule yes and what if we don't have a dual system what um do we just divide equally as we did when we had the thousand kips and we divided into 500 500 yeah you should be able to and show you what the reason only in dual system it says here dual system was a special mode frame capable of resisting at least 25 percent of the prescribed size of forces but in here, nothing like this, right? So whatever the distribution that you get out of the restriction analysis, just use it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. No Professor, problem. what if one side is dual system and the other is not? Then still we will use uh, 25 uh, for, for example, if uh, X axis is uh, dual system and Y axis is not, then for only X axis, we will use 25%, right? You just do it in the direction when you have a dual system. Okay.
Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, C1 system was R factor of eight versus dual system was R factor of eight. Which system is more ductile? Uh, dual system. What do you say, Mohammed? C1, the moment frame is- They're the same. When R factor is the same, it means ductility factor is the same. Okay. Okay, good. After the midterm one would be, would need to study, right? Or yes. Study? Okay. Except for slides at number 10. Okay. Number 10, okay. which means we start the one that we start today, it is not gonna be in there. It's not giving the exam. Okay, that's great to hear. Thank you. All right. Um, Professor, what about submitter number two? Is it going to be on the exam, like anything from submitter two? And what about the questions about column? Okay. Did you hear about this? I said that this is not going to be there, right? And I give you the yes. exam. I told you exactly what's giving the exam. Okay. Right? Did I? Yes. Okay. Now, I just want to be sure that you understand what the exam is going to include, right? So, there are three uh, problems and one theoretical question, right? Exactly. Correct. And you know what's giving the problem. One of them is going to be about connection, the other one's going to be about vibration, the other one's going to be about lateral force distribution to examine you or to test you on this issue here, that you understand distribution when you have a steel structure system, like dual system versus long frame system. So now you know what's giving the exam, right? You have a good, very good idea. So you know exactly what to study. A second here. Here are the four items. I'm gonna put them right here. And of course, it's gonna be recorded, right? I'm gonna post it. All right. Here are the four items that you need to do. The strength of the bolt group. Where are the bolt group? Oh, oh these bolts. Yes. Does he have eccentricity or the force is going through them? Do you have eccentricity? Because yes. if you like to call this the demand, this gives you the reaction, this gives you the demand, this gives you the reaction. So yes, we have eccentricity. Item number two, the shear trends of the shear tab, this shear tab here, you know how to figure out the shear trends for it, right? Yes. Good. Shear trends of the beam is gonna be right here. And don't forget to consider what? The cuts. You remember mm -hmm. this cuts, right? And if the beam here does have this notch, if it's straight, there is no the scope here. You don't do any deduction for it. But if you have this deduction, you need to consider it. Oh. Uh, how will we consider the deduction? If you know this height, if this height is given to you, if from here to here is given to you. If you know this distance here, right? This height. If I said that this scope is gonna be one inch, you come here to the beam depth, subtract an inch. And then we still have to subtract the holes for the bolts, right? Yes. In this case, but they... if you don't have any of that and the beam is just extended this way, right? Yes. So in this case, you don't do any deduction for this code. Because now you know the shear trends of the beam. After that's going to be the weld. Which weld? This weld here. So in this slide set, you have number one and number four. You don't have two and three because you are aware of them. You have done them before in steel beams. Yes. And this is exactly what you have seen in your project, correct? Yes. Okay, good. All right. I'm actually double checking for the shear. Shear uh, what? Is the FTN for, FTN for rupture, the number two, the shear strength of the shear tab? No. Number two is going to be the same, the one that you say 0.65, and then I told you, you know, it's going to be 0.6 times FY. Oh, okay. 
So you're gonna be doing this 0.6 times Fy for the shear tab and for the steel beam. Okay. For both of them, right? Okay, yes. Okay. Now for the bolt group, we went through this already. You know this in details, we have recording on this. Now it depends here on the length, right? On the eccentricity, which is gonna be very close in numbers if you have three bolts. How about the weld? I'm gonna say for the weld, what's gonna happen? You remember this factor? It depends on what? On A factor, which is what? EX divided by, is gonna be EX divided by L. So how much is the L in this case, in this example? Nine. Nine, Nine inch. Nine. So if I change this length, E over L is gonna be different. This E over L is not gonna be one third. It can be maybe three divided by 10. This is gonna be 0.3. This is gonna be this. Or it's gonna be, it just can be a different number, right? Yes. So we have done the bolts. Here's give you the bolt. When you have a group of bolt and you have done the weld. Here's a group of bolt. Just give you right here. We're gonna be doing this analysis. Number of bolts. Let's say that you have three bolts and three inches give you 1.75, right? Yes. If you have three bolts, three inches give you 1.75 times VRN. How would you do here VRN? Oh, VRN, you cannot read it off the table. Again, you will need to go to this guy here, to this table. You remember this table? Which means for this fastener or this bolt, I'm gonna give you F sub U. Yes. If I said N, use 0.45. If I use X, use 0.563. Yes. Uh, you're gonna tell us if it's N or X, right? If it's gonna be N or X? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you this. What's the difference here between N and X? Explain it to me. Based on this. To be honest, like when I was studying this, like I see the difference in the picture and I know that this middle line is uh, is the plane, the shear plane. Yeah. But I'm not sure how to put this into words. Like I'm, okay. I'm not so in this case, the thread is gonna be sheared off. In this case, the thread is not sheared off. So this okay. expected to be stronger than this, right? Yes. Okay, very good. So here's another question here, right? I wanna get you another picture of this. And you'll figure out what I'm talking about. Did you hear about something called, uh, like what is this? This is just a bolt. So did you hear about any fasteners that doesn't have any threads? No. Okay. So if the statement says no threads, would you use N or X? Um, I would use N. But there is no thread. Um. Okay, let me go here to this picture. If you have some thread and you're concerned about it, you're gonna be in the N condition, right? Yeah. You said if you have no thread at all, that, that would be N condition, right? Why? Are you shearing off through a thread in this case? No. Okay, so it's gonna be X. Am I correct? No. Are you guys awake here with us? Are you there? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so here's a question for you. Here's a question for you. We were just discussing difference between N condition and X condition. We say in N condition, you're gonna be shearing off the thread. And the bolt or fastener is going to be weaker than the fastener in the X condition. So what I'm saying, if I give you here a fastener that doesn't have any threads, would it be N or X? There is no thread. X. X. It's going to be an X condition. Why? Because here you have a concern, right? Your concern, you're going to be shearing off the thread and the fastener or the bolt is not going to be as strong. But if there is no thread at all to worry about, why would you call it to be N? 
Mike, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm there. Does it make sense, this argument here? Yeah, because, it makes sense. yeah because I'm saying, he. what's the problem here? Of course, you'd like to use the X condition because it's be stronger, right? Yes. You'd like to use this. What's going to stop you is give me the thread if you are cutting through the thread. But if I'm telling you, there is nothing here to worry about. Why would you use this? Go ahead and use this, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So if the threads of uh, the bolt are not considered, we should uh, use X, right? Yes, like if, if we are no not thread, use X. Going about anything. Yes, because you don't have anything to worry about in this case. Uh, professor, for the shear type design, do we consider single shear or double shear? It depends. Are you going to see here two plates? Let me go to the end of this, to the end picture. Is this one plate or two plates? I see here that one you have plate. here one plate and then you have a beam. But if I have two plates, I'm going to have double shear because you're going to have two plates like this. The beam is giving the middle, right? This is here is giving you double shear. Okay, got you. And uh, Professor, for the thickness of the plate, we just assume a thickness and then we check it, right? The thickness of what? Uh, the thickness of shear tab. I'll give it to you. It's going to be given to you in the analysis, right? So I'm giving you a picture. It's going to have the shear tab. Thickness. Okay, because uh, in the uh, submitted, we weren't given any thickness of shear tab. You so should assume, assume some good thickness. Yes, something that's going to make it work. Okay. Professor, uh, for the welding, uh, the point zero. 0 0.707 times uh, TW, is that like a safe uh, consideration for the thickness of the weld? Yeah, but there's an easier way of doing it. I don't know if you still remember this or not, because if you go here through this, you don't really need to have this 0 0.707. There's a way of doing it. Did you see this? But this is the, the strength of the weld, right? Yes, the strength of the weld when you have eccentric connection like this. So you should be using this table. You need to understand how to use this table. Go back to the connection lecture, watch it, try to see exactly what, what's meant there, what was discussed. Okay. You really need to know how to use this table, right? And here's the strength. You see the trends here? Also, yes. you can see it, it is right there. It's right here. See this? If you are N equals 0 0.75, which is a fee factor, CDL. Where's the CDL? Do you see it here? It's right here. C, D, L. How about T1? They say C1 is going to be equal to 1.0. Right? C1 is 1.0. See this? Yes. So it's going to be three values. C and D and L. C, D and L. L is going to be the length. This is going to be number of 16 of an inch. And I know it's going to be on both sides, right? And C factor is going to be taken from this table. You don't need here to do the 0.707. 0 0.707 was needed to develop just the basic value of the equation, which is this one here. See this one? Yes. Okay. And it's safe to assume k equals zero, right? Yes, it is not safe. It is, the, the, the table is based on this. Look at this table here. It says, in this case, k is gonna be equal to zero. Look at this. In our situation, you see values for k of zero. Okay. Okay, awesome, thank you. If we have two shear tabs, would it still be the same situation where the weld strength is considered for two welds on the outside? And we would still yes, use the because, because most likely you cannot really weld and you have lots of noise next to you. Um, the, yes, and you are correct. This gave you the same table. Nothing is going to change. It's only the bolt because if you have two plates, just imagine you have two plates like this. How would you weld the distance between them, right? How would you provide any weld in the middle? You cannot access it, correct? Yeah, just the outside. So let's give you so only the So we will uh, multiply the weld strength by two, right? No. So, um, for example, if we have two shear tabs, then still it will be pi Rn is equal to C C1 Dn. That's now it. we are going to have one weld line on each side of the plate. But right in the middle between the two plates, you're not going to be doing any welding. Correct? Yes. Okay, so, good. 
So it's gonna so be two lines of well. Listen, so it's gonna be two line of well, which means it's gonna be similar to this, which is similar to this. So you don't really do any multiplication by any number, like two or three or whatever, right? You don't do okay. any of that. Yeah. All right. Let's say good night, unless you have more questions to me. Thank you, Thank you, Wednesday. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you, Professor. Good night.